chat window open so I can see if you type a question. Um, but just the muting prevents the background noise. I know you guys all like like potato chips and stuff like that, but hearing it over here is not that great of a thing. It just gets in the way of everyone else hearing what I'm saying. So I want to talk about transformers first. Okay, now, before we go into the PowerPoint, let's just again take a look at the symbol of what we have okay and again i use a symbol sheet that i've made a sheet that i've made a long time ago i've drawn out all the symbols over the years that i've taught and i basically have them on a blank pdf okay you can use pdf expert you can make a blank page and you can draw symbols out then once you have them in a really neat and organized way or as neat as you're going to get them you can just start pasting them into schematics. So draw them once, know what they are, and you can cut and paste them, and it's a way to actually help you with your schematics. Okay, uh, it's also a way to help you remember what the symbols are. So when we're talking um, transformers, okay, in the oil term, most often we're talking how we take our voltage and go from the 120 volt line voltage Again, that's a term that I used yesterday, 120 volt line voltage to the 24 volt control voltage, okay? Because I don't want to have 120 volts on a thermostat in the middle of a living room, dining room, or hallway. Does anybody know why I don't want to have 124, 120 volts on the thermostats? Because it only requires 24 volts. Well, yeah, they, they do only require 24 volts, but what about another reason? Does anybody know the other reason I don't want 120 volts there? Well, it's short. My start of Start it up. How many people have kids? I do. Do they put their fingers into things that they're not supposed to do ever? Okay. You have kids who have... who who grab hold of stuff that they shouldn't, stick knives and forks into stuff they shouldn't. Hey, I have adults that stick knives and forks into stuff they shouldn't. But we're really worried about safety. Okay, so if a thermostat has exposed terminals inside of it. If you pull the cover off a thermostat, there's exposed wires there. Okay, I don't want a kid to walk along and maybe stick something that's metal, like a knife, up inside the thermostat. I'm really concerned about safety, and that's what this whole thing is. We don't want to put line voltage, which is our higher voltage, any place where we could have an unsafe condition. There's another reason, too. Thermostat wires 18 or 22 gauge. Okay, it's very small wire. I can pull thermostat wire through walls. I can run it long distances, okay, and I can get thermostat wire just about any place that I can get a string through, okay. If I'm running line voltage, I have to have much heavier wire, 14 gauge, 12 gauge, whatever I have to have. So I have to have much different wire between the thermostat wire and the uh, line voltage. So again, we have safety and we have size of wire, not to mention most of the thermostats you buy are 24 volts okay but even if I had a line voltage thermostat and they do make them okay I don't want to pull 120 volts into an area where I'm gonna have somebody who possibly touches it so what we have to do is we have to take our line voltage that's coming into a system okay we're gonna take our line voltage and we're going to take it into a thermostat or into a transformer, okay, first, before we get to the thermostat. So here, I've connected a transformer. Now, as we're going to talk about when I go through the PowerPoint, okay, a transformer is a really strange device in respect that it is both a load and a source. Guys, let me say that again. A transformer is both a load and a source okay but they're not electrically connected okay i have a coil of wire i have a coil of wire here and i have a coil of wire here and i have a magnetic core in the center the two of these devices are not electronically connected the coil of wire on the primary side, which is my 120 volt load, the primary side is always the load. Okay? 
is a coil of wire. It generates a magnetic field when I energize it. The 24 volt side, which is called the secondary side of the transformer, and again, I'll go through this again, but the 24 volt side, which is the secondary side of my transformer, that is a source. This coil of wire captures the magnetic field and creates current. So the only thing connecting the load and the source is a magnetic field. Any questions? Negative. Okay, so let's talk about transformers, because that's where we need to start. Okay, because before we can talk about control circuits and how things are controlled, we have to have an understanding of transformers. Now, transformers in an oil system, you have two transformers in an oil furnace. Okay, we have a transformer that takes our line voltage and turns it into control voltage. But we also have an ignition transformer that takes our line voltage of 120 volts and turns it into 10,000 or 14,000 volts, depending on the system. So you have two types of transformers. We have one that creates the lower voltage, and we have one that creates the higher voltage. So just be aware of that. A transformer is a non-electrical device, as I just explained. They're both a load and a source. So when I ask you a future question on a test or a quiz or something coming up, that says what device is both a load and a source? The correct answer is a transformer. The secondary side of the transformer is what produces my electrical current. So basically a transformer has an iron core that two sets of wires are wrapped around. The primary winding and the secondary winding are both wrapped around that iron core. Well, it could be steel too, but most often it's iron. When we energize the primary winding, okay, we actually create a magnetic field. The iron or steel core care amplifies and routes that magnetic field, and the secondary winding is wrapped around the magnetic field. Okay, what happens is, let me go back. What happens is that that magnetic field is captured, and any time I have a magnetic field in a coil of wire, it's going to create voltage. There's two symbols for transformers. First is the standard symbol that we are going to use. Honestly, this is the one that we use most often. In electronics and in electrical, if you were taking electrical or low voltage or one of those programs, you would be more looking at sometimes the variable secondary. We don't use the variable secondary in the HVAC industry. Okay, we only use the one with the standard iron or steel core. Our industry says we will always have transformers for the control voltage side that is rated at 24 volts. Okay, our, we, our standard voltage for the secondary side is 24 volts. Now, some of you folks who have been around more than one term, tell me what you normally get when you take the voltage reading of a transformer. What do you normally see on the secondary side? 27. Yeah, 26, 27. Okay. The reason for that difference is because under load, okay, when I put a transformer under load of a full control system, I need it to be over 24 volts. Okay. If I ever take a voltage reading of a transformer, and this goes into your troubleshooting toolbox, if I ever take a voltage reading of a transformer and get an exact 24 volts, I'm going to start looking at replacing that transformer. It may not be dead yet, but it sure is close. Okay, this is a transformer. Looking at this transformer, 
Again, I do have people here who have been in the course for more than one term. What can you tell me about this transformer? Just looking at it, what can you tell me about this? Steel. Well, yeah, okay, we have steel. I give you that. What else can you tell me about the transformer? The magnetic field. What about the wiring? Oh, yeah, four wires on the arm. Um... <laughs> okay, what's my yellow wire on this transformer? What side is it, primary or secondary? Secondary. It's the secondary. So this is my 24-volt rated side. You'll always have two wires. Does it? Do we have a positive and a negative on a transformer that we use in HVAC? Do we have a positive or negative? Yeah, always. Do, do we use direct current or AC? What kind of question? It's, it's AC. If you wanted to use a direct current, you would have to have a rectifier to use that. Right. So do I, in AC, do I always, do I have a positive or a negative? You mm -mm. have both all the time. Yeah, I don't have a positive or a negative. Now, on some transformers, you'll see a common labeled. So you might have a, you might have a red and a blue wire there, or you might have a white now, nah, white is not normally there. It might be a red and a green, blue and green. So you might have two different color wires on the output, but the reality is we're still dealing with AC current. We're dealing with the sine wave, and that's a pretty bad sine wave, but that's what it's meant to be. Now, what can you tell me about this side of the transformer, where the four wires are? What type of transformer is this? And again, guys who are first-termers, I don't expect you to uh, know this. That's why I'm going through this. Gentlemen who've been around before, what type of transformer is this? Step down. It is a step down. What about the four wires? Do you remember the designation of this type of transformer? Fan center. Eh. Nah. How about a multi-tap? Has anybody mentioned multi-tap transformer to you? No. no. Okay. That's, okay, that's fine. I didn't know if it's ever been mentioned before. Okay, a multi-tap transformer allows you to use multiple inputs, okay? So, for example, and always my white wire is always considered common or neutral, or if you're on a higher voltage, L2, okay? And there's always a label on the side of that tells you what it is. So, let's say my, my white wire here would be either neutral or L2. My black wire would connect to 120 volts. My blue wire could be 208. And my red wire could be 240. So I can use this single transformer in a number of different voltages. Now I think it says it further on in the PowerPoint, but it's really critical that the wires you don't use have to be capped off because the minute you power this coil, okay, the wires you don't use still have energy on them. They still have power on them. So you have to cap off any unused wires. So let's say you're using the white and the black because you're dealing with a 120 volt power supply. You have to cap off the blue and the red. Now, for those of you making uh. notes on this, you have to cap them individually. You cannot put them under one wire nut. Okay, if you put them under one wire nut, you're going to have smoke and fire on the transformer. Okay, because it will short out the winding. That's a multi-tap transformer. I can carry one device on my truck, and I can use it in a wide range of situations. Okay, I can use it if I'm doing oil in a house. I can use it in a rooftop unit. I can use it wherever. I have a lot of choices with a multi-tap transformer. Okay, so the transformer primary is the side of the transfer that voltage and a current is applied to. On the last picture I just showed you, that's the multi-tap side. Okay, it's a set of windings wrapped around an iron core. The primary produces a magnetic field. The transformer secondary, okay, is the side that produces the current. 
The windings are also wrapped around a magnetic core. But the secondary side is isolated from the primary. It's its own circuit. So any time you have a transformer in a circuit, you actually have two individual circuits. Okay, and that is a very important thing to understand. There's no electrical connection between the primary and the secondary side of the system. And in oil, there's no electrical connection between the primary and the high voltage ignition side of the system. They're isolated. It's all done with a magnetic field. Now, the other important thing we have to look at is this is just an example of a, prime, of a transformer. My primary side has a thousand turns of wire on it. Turn of wire is just a wrap of wire. My secondary side has 500 turns of wire on it. If I apply 120 volts to my primary side and create a magnetic field, my secondary side, which has half the amount of wires, is going to carry, pick up half the voltage. Again, if I have a thousand turns on the primary and I'm supplying 120 volts, and if I only have 500 turns on the secondary, I'm only going to pick up half the voltage. That's how a step-down transformer works. It's actually how a step-up transformer works, too. But my primary side is the high voltage and a step-down. My secondary side is low voltage. It all comes together because of the number of turns of wire. Less turns of wire picks up less of that magnetism. Does anybody have any questions on this? Negative. Okay, so again, step-down transformer reduces voltage from the primary to the secondary. Step-up transformer increases the voltage from the primary to the secondary. The ratio of the windings between the primary and the secondary determines how much the voltage is changed. Now, let me ask you all a question. What happens if this transformer is put in backwards? What would happen if someone connected this side to 120 volts... I connected this side to my control circuit. Try it. I've, I've done that. What would you fry? The transformer. In the you might fry the transformer, but what else do you take a good chance of damaging? Circuit board on there. Everything that's connected to the control side of the circuit. I've seen people do it. Yeah, I've done it once. <laughs> Was there smoke and fire? Uh, there was a lot of smoke, no fire. We caught it quick enough. Okay, Sparky. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, uh, no, the guy who taught me electrical way back when told me that all electrical components run on smoke. If you let the smoke out of them, they don't work anymore. Yeah, it didn't help, though. I was, I was colorblind, and both of the leads were yellow. Oh, that so, hurts. Yeah. I was set up for failure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keeping it real simple. If the primary side has 10 windings and the secondary side has 1 windings, you have a step-down ratio of 10 to 1. So if you've applied 120 volts to this transformer with a 10 to 1 winding, you would deliver 12 volts on the secondary side. Okay. Again, it all has to do with the ratio of wires. Transformers are rated by voltage on the primary side and volt amps on the secondary side. We primarily use 120, 208, 230, 240, and 480 volt transformers. The secondary side is normally 24 volts, but it can range between 24 and 28. I want as close to that 28 volts as I can get. I do not like seeing a transformer, and this a lot goes back to industry experience. I don't like seeing a transformer that is just providing 24 volts. Now, VA rating, you've seen this formula before. It's called something else. It's volts times amps on the secondary side equals volt amps. 
what other what other formula uses volts times amps? Ohms. Not ohms. Close, but no, not ohms. Resistance. Nah, different different pie chart. What was that? Watts. Watts. Okay, so VA is just a transformer rating of watts. Secondary volts times secondary amps. Now, why is that important? When I go to the supply shop, I need to know three things. I need to know what my primary voltage is. Okay? I need to know what my secondary voltage is. And I need to know what the VA rating is to get the transformer that I need. Okay, now if it's an HVAC supply shop, the only thing you're going to get is 24 volts rating. If it's you go to Granger's or a general electrical supply shop, you better know what that secondary voltage is because otherwise you don't know what they're going to give you. Okay, so you need to know primary, secondary, and your VA rating. Now, um, amperage in a transformer, I'm going to go back two screens, or sorry, three screens. Amperage is really strange. Okay, so if I am supplying 120 volts to this transformer, and if I'm getting 60 volts out, we haven't talked about current yet. So let's say I this transformer is using one amp. Okay, and we're stepping down to 60 volts. Amperage is exactly the opposite. I will have two amps to work with there. Amperage and voltage is exactly the opposite in a transformer. If I'm stepping down the voltage, I'm increasing the amperage by the same amount. If I'm stepping up the voltage, I'm decreasing the amperage by the same amount. Okay. So step down voltage, step up amperage. Okay, our average transformer, our minimum transformers that we use in the field, okay, is basically 40 VA. That's our minimum transformers we use, is 40 VA. Okay. And that's the rating it can handle. That's not necessarily what you're using but these are the ratings it can handle. To troubleshoot transformers, we do what we always do. We check for source on the primary side, and, we, and then we check voltage on the secondary side. If there's no voltage on the secondary side, okay, look for a fuse or breaker that might be built into the transformer. For example, in our shops, we do order transformers a lot now with a fuse or breaker on it. It's there for an obvious reason. If there's a wiring problem or something, it's going to pop the fuse or breaker in the transformer. Not going to burn out the transformer, we hope. If there's still no voltage on the secondary side, it's a bad transformer. Replace it. You're not going to fix a transformer. You're not going to re recoil that wire inside. Replace it. Okay? So... When we talk about transformers, that is basically what a transformer is. Okay, I have a coil of wire, I have another coil of wire. We have a primary and a secondary side. If I take a voltage reading from here to here, I better have 120 volts. Okay, if I don't have 120 volts there, what do I need to do on a, on a powered circuit? What do I need to do if I don't have 120 volts there? Pull out your meter. Well, I already have the meter out because I have I'm measuring 120 volts. But what if I don't have 120 volts there? What do I need to do? Check the switch. Check your wire connections. Yeah, easiest way to do that. You take your you take your meter and you go back to every connection back to the line and you see if I have any break in the wiring there. Then you take your other side of your meter, 
and you jump around and keep going back and back and back until you get to the neutral. Okay, because you're going to find a break in a wire someplace. Because guess what? At the transformer connection, even if the transformer is bad, I should have 120 volts or whatever my source voltage is. Now, once I've checked the primary side, then I need to come down and check the secondary side. Okay, so I put my meter leads down here on the secondary side. What should I have there? 24. Okay. 26, 27, right? Yeah, to me, I should have over 24. Okay, you should have over 24. 26, 27, 28, I'm fine with. Again, 24 I take as a valid answer if you gave it to me on a piece of paper or test, but I'm never going to see just 24. So if I see my 26 volts here, we're good. We know our transformer is good. What happens if I see zero volts here? What do I do? Check your wire leads. Or uh, actually, if the 120 side's fine, then the whole transformer is fine. Yeah, exactly. If I have 120 volts going into the transformer and zero volts coming out of the transformer, it's a bad transformer. Check the check for a fuse, of course, on it. Check for a breaker built into the side of it. But if it, but if everything's good, if the breaker's closed or if the fuse is good. Or if there's no fuse or breaker, if I don't have if I don't have voltage here, it's a bad transformer. If I have voltage there, then you better find out what else is bad. Okay? So that's how you troubleshoot a transformer. Now, we have our transformer. Okay, I have my transformer here. Will I take this to the next step? Okay? We now have a line side of the system, and we have the starting of a building block of my control side. Our line side of the system is up here at the top, okay, where I have 120 volt power. That's my line side of the system. Okay, I might have a service switch, most likely in oil. I will have at least one service switch. Okay, I'm going to have I'm going to have a line and a neutral because most oil systems are under 20 volts. You rarely until you get an industrial oil, you rarely see a 240 volt oil system. Okay, so I have my line side. Okay, I now need my control side. Control side has things like the thermostat on it. That's your primary control on the control side of a thermos of a of an oil system. We have our thermostat. Okay, so I'm going to pull in. Now eh, let's just pull in the thermostat, not the pressure switch as well. Okay, I'm going to pull in my thermostat. Yeah, let's pull the whole thermostat in. Part of the problem with cutting and pasting sometimes. There we go. Okay. I have my thermostat. What type of thermostat is this? Close on drop. Close on temperature drop. So it's a heating thermostat, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, we're going to come in here. Now I'm on my control voltage side of the circuit. <coughs> I'm going to connect my thermostat in. And we, have, we still have to talk about the different types of thermostats, but that's okay. Let's just say this is a heating thermostat. Heating thermostats have two wire connections. I have an R and I have a W. And then we also just need to label the thermostat because it's a thermostat. Okay. Might as well label the service switch while I'm at it. Okay. So I have an R and a W. I have 24 volt power that's now coming out of my transformer and I'm coming to my thermostat. You look at a thermostat on the wall in your house, it has the same connections. Okay, out of the thermostat, I have a W. Okay, used to always stand for white. 
for people who couldn't figure out what wires to put on things. Now it's just a W terminal because we see different colored wires on everything. Okay, now the thermostat has to control something. Okay, and whatever we control has to control a line voltage component because I don't have 24 volt blower motors. I don't have 24 volt burner motors. They're all line voltage. They're heavy duty. They need to provide a lot of power. 24 volt loads can't provide a lot of power. There's nothing for them to really overcome on the power wise. So what we do is we use a device called a relay. Okay, a relay has two components. And again, I have a PowerPoint on this. But this is just to introduce the idea and see where we're going. Okay, a relay has two components. Okay, we have a relay coil. That relay coil goes into my control voltage. Okay, it's a 24 volt coil. Okay, and that relay coil always goes back to the common on the transformer. It always goes back to common. Okay, so we'll just draw that common in just to be sure we're getting the right part in. Okay, we're going to label this. And I'm just going to label it HR because it's a heating relay. Okay, because we're dealing with heat. Okay, a relay coil is nothing more. A relay coil is nothing more than a coil of wires around an iron core that provides, builds up magnetism. Anytime I've applied voltage to a coil of wire, it creates magnetism. That's all a relay coil is. Okay, now a relay has a second part as well that goes on the line voltage side. Okay, second part on the line voltage side is my contact. Now we're going to go with the normally open contact just because we can. Okay, normally open means that in its unpowered state, it's an open switch. Okay, so I now have a normally open contact. I went. Ah! Jeez, damn, okay. okay. Yeah, could someone mute themselves, please, before I embarrass somebody on the call? Okay, so my normally open contact is connected to whatever load I want to control. Could be a burner motor, could be in this case I'm just going to use a light bulb, could be whatever. Okay, and then we come back to neutral. Okay, so what this is doing, this allows our relay on the low voltage side to control my line voltage circuit. That's the whole point of the relay and contactors we're about to talk about. Any questions on this diagram before I go into my relay PowerPoint? Nope. Okay. Okay. Let me... Get the correct PowerPoint. Okay, so relays and contactors all have to do with controlling the second, the high voltage from a low voltage source. Okay, so it's a relay is a device that consists of a coil and a set of contacts. The coil and set of contacts are isolated, which means they're protected from each other. Two different voltages, two different circuits. It's designed to be usable where one circuit must control another. My low voltage control circuit has to control high voltage loads. That's the whole purpose of both relays and contactors. The relay coil is a spool of wire that's wrapped around an iron core. Okay? When the wire is energized, in other words, electricity is applied to it, there's a magnetic field generated. The field pulls in an armature that closes or opens a set of contacts. 
When a relay is shown in a schematic, it is always shown in the de-energized mode. In other words, whenever I draw in the schematic, it's considered de-energized. Okay, that's always. Schematics are drawn as a de-energized, whatever it looks like when the power is off. Every coil has a voltage rating. This rating is the voltage that you can apply to the coil. These ratings are normally 24 volts, 120 volt, 208 or 230 volts. Now the key is you may not apply 120 volt, 120 volts to a 24 volt coil. And you cannot put 24 volts to a 120 volt coil and expect good things to happen. In the first scenario, if you put 120 volts to a 24 volt coil, you're going to burn that relay up. Okay? Sometimes it's actually bad enough where you leave charcoal marks on the wiring board. If you apply 24 volts to a 120 volt coil, it is very likely that your transformer is going to blow. Nothing bad will happen to the relay. It just won't work. Okay, but you might harm your transformer. The coil rating is stamped on the side of the relay. And the coil is a load in a schematic circuit. The coil does work. It uses power. It does work. It's a load. Relay contacts are the switching device of the relay. When the contacts are in a schematic, they're treated as an open or closed switch. Relay contacts come in two varieties. It's either normally open or normally closed. Okay, and again, normally open or normally closed. So if we take a look at my diagram here, okay, this is normally open. Okay, it's unpowered, and my relay is in a normally open position. Okay, if I did a, wanted to do a normally closed relay, I'd be easy, it would be an easy change to make. All I would do is draw a line through it. And now I have a normally closed relay. Okay. So again, we're just talking what, the re, what basically the relay is, shown in the unpowered. Now, with this diagram drawn as it is now, is this load on or off? Is it energized or de-energized? De-energized. Yeah, it's de-energized. But if I have a normally closed relay, okay, where I've done this to it in the schematic, is this load on or off? It would be on once you energize it. There is the opposite. So it's on now. Yeah, it's on now. And what would happen when I energize this coil? Turns off. Turns off, yes. Okay. So again, normally closed and normally con open contacts. The relay contacts are attached to an armature. In other words, a part, a sort of an arm in there that's moved by the magnetic force of the coil. The little relay contacts have metal points, sort of like a silver point or a gold point that comes in contact with each other. These points complete the circuit. Normally open contacts are the equivalent of a normally open switch. When the relay coil is de-energized, as I just showed you, it's an open in the circuit. When the relay coil is energized, they closed just like turning on a light switch. When the coil is de-energized again, they open. Okay, so it's all based on that coil being energized or de-energized. It's all based on that magnetic field. A normally closed contact is a closed switch when the coil is de-energized. Okay, normal position is when it's de-energized. When the coil is energized, the switch opens and stops the current from reaching the load. When the coil is de-energized again, the contacts close. We use both of these positions in the oil term. The contacts are rated with the number of amps they can control, and this is critical. The contacts in relays and contactors are rated with the number of amps they control. The contacts are also rated with the type of load they can control. It would either be inductive, which inductive is anything that has a motor, or it's resistive, like a heater, 
Okay, the reason the inductive loads are important is because the amperage changes in an, in an inductive load. To basically put that out there, if I, ha if I power a motor or anything with a coil, when I first power it, the voltage, the amperage goes up. That's because it hasn't created its own magnetic field that creates resistance. As soon as the power has taken, the motor starts turning or the load is in use, that amperage is going to drop down pretty far. Okay, this, this spike in this amperage is called LRA. Okay, the spike in the amperage is called LRA for locked rotor amperage. That's my startup spike amperage anytime I start an inductive load. My average running amp is called FLA for full load amperage. It could also be called RLA. They're sort of the same number, just different devices for running load amperage. Okay, FLA, RLA are sort of interchangeable, but LRA is a very important. Now, there's a mathematical difference between these two. Does anybody know what the difference is between LRA and FLA, RLA? Just on average. Okay, LRA is six times, well, actually between five and eight, but the number six works very well. LRA is six times more than FLA or RLA. Okay, so if I'm pulling an FLA or if I have a motor rated at three amps in a running condition, my startup spike is going to be six times more on amperage. If I have a compressor rated at um, 30 amps running, my startup can be actually six times more. It's a split second, but we have to worry about that with our contacts, and we have to worry about that with our ratings. Okay, so there's a big amperage spike. Every component has a sequence of operation. The best technicians can always describe the sequence of operation to someone over the phone by giving the sequence of operation. Okay, if you ever call technical support, they're going to want to know what it's doing. Okay, if you say it's not doing what it's supposed to do, they're going to want you to be more descriptive. Okay, a good technician can always describe the operation of a circuit to somebody over the phone or at an email site or something. They've got to be able to describe the sequence of operation. In order to describe the sequence of operation of what's not working, you have to understand the sequence of operation, how it's supposed to work. So the sequence of a Mars relay is simple. When the relay is de-energized, there's no power across the coil. And I'll show you the diagram of this in a minute. The contacts between points 1 and 3 are normally open. The contacts between points 1 and 2 are normally closed. The relay coil is then energized with 24 volts. This closes the contacts between 1 and 3 and opens the contacts between 1 and 2. In other words, it's drawn in my normally open position. In my normal position, 1 and 3 are normally open. 1 and 2 are normally closed. I energize the coil. It swaps. My normally closed open, my normally open closes. And this is just an example of the, how the normally open and the normally closed are drawn. Okay, normally open contact, normally closed contact. Okay, and my coil. You'll see coils sometimes drawn by different people and different manufacturers as just a circle, okay, with a designation in it or possibly just a spool of wire. Okay, a couple coils of wire there. Okay, try to draw contacts in something that looks like this. I'm okay with like this. 
is actually a great picture of a contact. Surprised I could do that with a mouse. Okay, or the relay coil. Try to draw the coils in this type of manner, either here or here. If you draw it just as a coil of wire, it looks too much like a shaded pole motor. If you draw it as a circle, I have no idea if it's a light bulb or whatever. Let's draw our, let's draw our um, coils the way they should be so we can figure it out. Normally open contact, normally close contact. When you label these on a schematic, if I label the coil with a C, I need to label the associated contacts with the same letter designation. That's why labeling is so important. If I, have a, if I spec out a system and I all of a sudden have a letter designation on something, I need to know what the letter designation is on all of the associated components. Okay? Because I need to know what's controlling what. A relay, as I said, is designed to control a load in a same circuit or another circuit. Okay, so if I take a look at this, okay, is my top or bottom light bulb energized? Anybody? Top or bottom light bulb is top. It energized? Top. Someone mm. says top. Is bottom. it energized or de-energized? De-energized. Top one's de-energized. Bottom one's energized. Okay. Yeah, that's correct because I have a normally open. So my line voltage right now is going through the bottom load. Okay. The normally closed contact C1 is energized. Normally open is not energized. Switch is open. My coil C1 has no power on it. We've now closed switch one. What has happened to that coil? Is coil becomes energized. And what does that do to the contacts? Flips them. It closes it. Flips it off. Okay, my normally open, which was the top one on the last diagram, closes. And my normally closed, which was the bottom one, on the last diagram is now open. We've switched positions. You see that? Okay. That's how a relay works. Energize the coil and the contacts either close or open. It's actually a pretty simple device. Just don't overanalyze it. Now when you look at this, okay, this is the Mars relay. It's the most frequent relay you're going to see in the field. It has a coil, which you can actually see down here at the bottom. This is a coil of wire, visible. And it has two sets of isolated contacts. One set is pin 1, 2, and 3. The other set is pin 4, 5, and six, and I'll show you another diagram of this. There's two terminals down at the bottom. We're off to one side of these things. That's my coil connections. So you have a common and a common. That's where my line voltage comes in, depending on what I'm using this for. And then I either have a normally open or normally closed off of each common. And I'll show you the internal thing in a minute. Okay. So common on a relay just says where I'm connecting my voltage to. It has nothing to do about voltage designations. That's where my input comes, either there or there. If we look at my diagram, this would be my common right there. Okay, so that would be pin 1, for example. If I go back over to this relay, I have a normally closed and a normally open that connects to pin 1. So in the case of my diagram, this right here would be pin 2, right there. 
if I had a normally closed actually that's pin 3 sorry pin 3 if I had a normally closed I'd have that pin right there now the way I just wired this diagram would this light bulb ever shut off guys would this light bulb ever shut off no no, because no matter if this coil is energized or de-energized, I still have a light bulb on. Still have a path to that bulb. Okay. And again, my two coils are down here, so most often this you'd have a 24-volt supply on here coming out of my control circuit. There's a label on the side of every relay. It's usually down here near the coil tells you what the coil voltages are and gives you the maximum amperages that the different circuits can handle. Okay, normally open is between pin 1 and 3 or 5, or sorry, 4 and 6. Again, 1, 2, 3, or 5, and six, there's no electrical connection between one, two, and three, four, five, and six. You can use different voltages. There's no electrical connection between four, five, and six and the coil. Okay? These relays are used a lot because I can do so much with them. Okay, this relay is the building block of HVAC, basically. Normally closed, it's between 1 and 2, or 4 and 5. Okay. When I look at it on a schematic, if I draw it out how it is in the relay, you can see that pin 1 and 4, okay, is what's considered my common point. Pin 1, when the relay is energized, it's going to feed pin 3. When the relay is de-energized, it's going to feed pin 2. Pin 4, when it's energized, it's going to feed, feed pin 6. When it's de-energized, it's going to pee, feed pin 5. So I can actually have two different voltages, two different circuits I'm controlling with the one relay. I use this a lot. Okay, we're going to use it a lot when we start talking about fan centers. We're going to use it a lot when we start talking about boilers. We're going to use it a lot when we talk about some of the things we can do with um, vent power venters. Okay. Contactors are really close in operation to relays. The only reason we mention contactors in this term is because sometimes we're dealing with heavy blower motors. Okay, sometimes I have a lot, I might have a 240 volt blower motor. I might have heavier amperage blower motors and other equipment. Most often in, um, in residential and commercial air conditioning or heating, boilers and the, the burner motors are all 120 volts. Okay, contactors have one or two sets of contacts that are normally open. Contactors are designated to be switching devices for loads with high amperages. Most contactors use control voltage, that's low voltage, to control high voltage loads. Okay, we use a low voltage, 24 volts, to control the high voltage load. Could be 244, 80, 720, and on up. Contactor coils are rated by voltage. Contactor contacts are rated by amperage. There's no difference on the ratings from that of relays. They're just higher ratings. They're written on the side of the contactor. Don't install a contactor if the load goes over either of these ratings. You don't want to do that. It's a bad thing to happen. Okay? 
So we have our contactor. This is a picture of a contactor. We have line voltages that can come in here. We have line voltages that can come in here. This is where we connect our load to on the right side. Again, we have two sides of this. It's double pole. Okay? It is either on or off. Most contactors are normally open. These two terminals off to the side here, this is my coil. These two terminals connect to my coil. There's two or more pins over here just so you can use it as a junction point. Don't try to put one wire on here and one wire on the other pin with different purposes. Okay, all it is is a junction point. You'll see that on a lot of equipment. Okay. When this coil is energized, these things right here pull down and close the path for power to flow completely through the contactor. Okay. When you're doing service on these things, once you get in the field, once you start looking at contactors, after about five years of use, you'll start seeing a lot of burning right here where I just put all my red ink. You'll see a lot of burning on each side of the contacts where the pins meet, okay, where this switch opens and closes. You can see it. The carbon will start building up just because there's a slight <laughs> spark there every time you start it. Carbon is an insulator. The more carbon there is, the more this is going to start heating up. Be careful, so you get to replace these about five every five years or so. It's a 60 buck part. Okay, again, normally open and coil. When I look at a schematic diagram of this, again, it's really easy. I have a coil and two normally opens. These two normally opens will close together. They're based on the same coil. They're going to close together. When you're troubleshooting them, it's a matter of looking at voltages across the load and the switching. Okay, so I'm going to run through an example where B2 is not working when SW1 is turned on. Okay, load B2 is not working when SW1 is turned on. So we're going to look at it on our normal condition. Okay, I'm going to take a voltage reading between line and neutral. You know, it helps if we know we have power. Okay, we want to make sure circuit is power. That's where you always start with your voltage reading, line and neutral. Then, I'm going to take a voltage reading between line and the line side of switch one. Okay, that should be a complete path. I better have power there. Then I'm going to take a voltage reading. I'm going to close that switch, of course, and I'm going to take a voltage reading from line to the load side of switch one. I should have zero volts if that switch is closed. Then again, with this switch closed, I'm going to take a voltage reading from line to the line side of the contact coil. I should have zero volts because, again, I have a perfectly good path down here. Then I'm going to go here. Again, we have this switch closed. I'm going to take a voltage reading from line to the low to the neutral side of C1 I should have 120 because voltage across an energized load okay is source I'm going to go all the way to the end if I have 120 here I'm going to have 120 here, but it's just still a good idea to check to the end. You want to check all the way through every branch. Okay, I'm going to go from, again, line to the line side of C1. 
Okay, then I'm going to go from the line to the load side of C1. What's the importance of this measurement getting zero? Why do I want this measurement? If this switch is closed, why do I want to check there? To make sure your contactor is working. Yeah, because if this is energized, if C1 is energized, that should be closed. So I should have a path there, right? Take from there to there. Again, switch one closed. That's closed. So I should have a full path. I should not have a difference in potential. Okay, that closed, that closed. I should now have... 120 volts because again voltage across an energized load is 120 and again because we always check the complete path just to be sure okay we should have 120 there now what I should do now this is the bulb that is not working this is be where it becomes interesting okay again switch one is closed C1 is open that C1 is back open. Okay, so I should have zero volts there because I have a complete path. So I'm getting a correct reading. Okay, again, that, 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 that should be closed. I'm proving that that's closed. Zero volts. It's tough to see up there, but that is a zero volt. Okay, again, that's closed, that's closed, that's closed, that's open, because we've energized the circuit. Remember, schematics are drawn in a de-energized position. Okay, I should have zero volts. I go across the load now. Now, here's where this becomes interesting. Go across the load. What should I have between this point and this point? Source voltage. You should have 120. Okay, but I'm only getting zero. Where's my problem? Your bulb or the line between the bulb and C2? Some place in this, some place here. We don't know yet where the problem is. I don't know if it's this or that. If I had a break in this line like here, I would have gotten 120 there if everything else is working right. I go there. I get 120. Can I now narrow down the problem because I have a path for neutral to there. I have a path for power. We've already verified that this is closed. We verified I don't have a break in here. Okay, can I now narrow down what this problem is? My C2 contact is not closing. So what's happened is this is getting all the energy. We know my coil is good because it closed C2 here, but it never closed C2 here. Because I was getting zero volts there, and I'm getting 120 volts there. C2 is staying open. Now, when you're in the field, what are you going to do if you have this situation? What are you going to do? You're just going to replace the contact. I'm going to replace the contact door. I'm going to replace the full thing because these are one assembly. You really can't, for the ones you're going to see in the oil, in oil equipment and in light commercial um, equipment, you're not going to rebuild these contactors. Once you start getting to heavy industrial, you can rebuild the contactor. Okay, but in the, you're just going to replace it. It's a $60 part. Cost me $12 to buy. Just going to replace it. Okay. Based on the last two measurements, the technician would determine that contactor C2 has a bad contact. 
Voltage across a load should not be zero. Voltage across a closed switch or contact should not be source. And that's what we were seeing here. I was seeing source across what a switch or contact that was supposed to be closed. Okay. So when we start talking about voltage reading and how we know what's happening with sequence of operation, this is why I really stress this. Okay. So a relay and a contactor, okay, just for review, is an electromechanical device used by one circuit to control another. The voltage is the coil voltage. The amperage is how the contacts are rated. You can control two separate voltages in one or two circuits. That's your relay. Contactor, okay, is double pole, open or closed. Okay, and we come back over here to the circuit that I drew, and you can really see how this comes, starts to come together. Okay, and this, the relays and the contactor and the transformer are your building blocks of HVAC. Once I understand how relays and contactors come together and work, okay, this is how we control everything in the HVAC industry. Even when we get to direct digital controls, we are still using the equivalence of relays and contactors. Any questions? No, sir. Anyone else? We good. Okay, if you guys have questions of this and need separate help on this, this is so important. Please send me an email or something. When you guys send me an email, please tell me what class you're in. I don't need to know campus or anything. I just need to know if you're in my oil class because I'm also teaching an air conditioning class, and it would be nice to give you the right information for what I'm teaching you. So um, let me know Let me know what what section you're in when you put, send me an email. Um, that is about all I have for today. Before you leave, just a couple reminders. First, we have homework assignments that are due on Monday, and there's a few labs that are due on Tuesday. Second reminder, when you're answering my discussion boards, you have to answer my question. I've been putting up with it, but when you answer my discussion boards, you have to answer my question. Just saying here doesn't cut it anymore. Okay, so please answer my question. I've been very forgiving about it, but I, there's certain things I need to know you guys know. Okay, so it's sort of important. So that's all I have. You guys have a great weekend, and we will see you Monday.